truly good to see everyone who's back with us tonight to study again from God's holy and revealed will. As you know, last Sunday night we were delving into the book of Ruth. It was suggested that since we are looking this summer at Ruth and Jonah, that we hear some teaching on Sunday night regarding both of those books. And so hopefully tonight we're going to conclude our look at Ruth and sometime in July deal with the book of Jonah in one or two lessons. But again, it's great to see everyone. Now when we look at the book of Ruth, remember what we said last week. We gave you one point from each chapter and asked you to read the book of Ruth with a focus upon that word, that point. Chapter 1, loyalty. Chapter 2, labor. Chapter 3, love. And chapter 4, legacy. Let's notice something concerning each one of these. In chapter 1, as we've said, loyalty. Notice something. One of the first things we learn about Ruth has to do with her loyalty. Ruth is truly one of the greatest examples of loyalty within the Bible. I don't think there's any dispute regarding that. In fact, when you look at verses 1 through 13 in the first chapter, you see that Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons, Malon and Chilion, they leave Judah because of famine, they go to Moab. While in Moab, Elimelech dies. And Malon takes Ruth for his wife, and Chilion takes Orpah. Well, those two men, Malon and Chilion, die. And so Naomi has heard that the Lord has blessed the land of Judah with grain, with bread. So she's planning to go back to her homeland. She urges her daughter-in-laws to stay. At first, both of them are intent on going with her. But after more persuasion, remember the Bible teaches that Orpah, she kissed Naomi and, of course, went back to her homeland. And Ruth clung to Naomi. Well, in these next few verses... Here's where we read about the loyalty of Ruth. Take your Bibles, please. Look at Ruth, the first chapter. Read with me chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. If the language sounds familiar, it should. At almost every wedding, some part of this context is incorporated because of the beautiful view of loyalty. But look at this. Ruth, the first chapter, beginning in verse 14, it says, Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. But wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Look at verse 18. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. What? a beautiful example, as we've said, concerning loyalty. One of the things missing in our time, one of the things missing in our society in so many people is this trait right here, this trait of loyalty. Think about some Bible verses. In Proverbs 17 and verse 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Both of those views in Proverbs 17, 17 identify loyalty. A friend loves at all times. They're loyal. A brother is born for adversity. They're loyal. In Proverbs 20 and verse 6, many a man proclaims his own loyalty, but a faithful man who can find. 
Remember also in Hosea 6 and verse 4, a sad verse. God says their loyalty is like the morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. In essence, God says they lack this principle. They lack this wonderful quality of loyalty. In Micah 4 and verse 5, although it doesn't speak of loyalty, in essence, explicitly, it certainly is talking about loyalty. Though all the people walk each in the name of their own God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord forever and ever. That's loyalty. Ruth is a great example of loyalty. Ruth distinguishes herself because of her loyalty. Well, in chapter 2, as we've said, labor. And we might not read every verse that we put up here tonight, but as widows, Naomi and Ruth are placed in a very vulnerable position. Turn with me, we will read this context because it's important for us to always remember that God has always protected and will always protect the weaker vessels. Orphans, widows, God is concerned about such. And here in Exodus 22, we find what God has to say in protecting the widows. Look at this. I'm going to read in Exodus 22, beginning in verse 22. It says, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. You think God's not serious about this? And so as Naomi and as Ruth find themselves widows, they are in a very vulnerable position. You remember in Deuteronomy 24 and verse 17, they were not to take the widow's cloak as a pledge. God is protecting the widows. James 1 and verse 27, pure undefiled religion before God the Father to visit the widows and orphans in their distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So notice this question. How will they be taken care of? Who will provide for them? And really when you talk about providing, that's what providence is all about. Providence teaches us that God will provide. And through the book of Ruth, as we noticed last week, we don't see God providing through His power, but we do see Him providing through His providence. Through circumstances, through events, through individuals, God is providing for His people. I find it interesting. Look at Ruth 1 and verse 22. Notice what it says, and what's interesting here... It's just a statement of fact, but notice the convenient time that they are going back to Judah. Look at Ruth 1 in verse 22. It says, So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Just in passing, it even shows God's providence there. And notice also in chapter 2 and verse 3. Notice what it says in this context. And really this is a tribute. It's a testimony to providence. Notice it says, Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened, notice this, And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. And so they just come at the beginning of the barley harvest. She just happens to be at the right place, the right field, a relative of Elimelech, Boaz. And so again, what we're looking at is, is providence. Who's going to take care of them? Now, here's what I like because you go through chapter 2. We won't read every one of those verses there, but through chapter 2, Ruth doesn't say, somebody is obliged to take care of me and just sit around and wait for their provisions. 
Ruth understands what it means to work. She distinguishes herself in chapter 1 because of her loyalty. She distinguishes herself in chapter 2 because of her labor. She's not afraid of hard work. She's going to provide to the best of her own ability for Naomi and for herself. Look at chapter 2, and we've already noticed it, but again, look at verse 3. And she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And it says, <clears throat> excuse me, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Look at verse 7. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Look at verse 10. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of, her hus of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and your land of your birth, and have come to a people you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Well, throughout chapter 2, that's what you see her doing. You see her laboring, you see her working, and you see her labor, her work, rewarded. We live today, sad to say, in a day of entitlement. People think they are entitled to what they want even though they're not willing to expend energy. In Proverbs 14 and verse 23, in all labor there is reward, but mere words lead only to poverty. You remember we put down here, uh, or we should have, I guess we didn't, in Matthew, the sixth chapter and verse 11, give us this day our daily bread, but remember, we just don't give that prayer. We just don't offer that prayer and wait for God to answer it miraculously. Yes, we pray that. Give us this day our daily bread. But if a man doesn't work, neither let him eat. 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 10. And so Ruth understood that principle of laboring. Again, we have created in this nation a welfare society. In everyone from all races have their hands out. You know the gospel song that we sing, red and yellow, black and white? They are precious in His sight. That's true, there's no doubt about it. But in our society, we've sort of changed the emphasis of that. Red and yellow, black and white. They're all living off the state tonight. Because that's what we're doing. And so here she distinguishes herself because of her labor. Remember 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And Hebrews 6 and verse 10. God is not so unjust so as to forget your labor or your good works. Well, again... Ruth distinguishes herself, her loyalty, her labor. Quickly, notice chapter 3, love. Now this was a difficult one because in chapter 3, we don't read really the word love. Do this. Go to chapter 4. Look at verse 15. Notice what it does say in chapter 4 concerning love. It says, And it may be to you a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. The women surrounding Naomi said, Your daughter-in-law who loves you, your daughter-in-law who is better to you than seven sons, has provided, of course, Obed for you, a nourisher in your old age. Well, what's interesting to me in chapter 3 Consider the Leveret custom in Israel. In Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, you remember that when a man marries, if that man dies, 
the brother of the deceased, would marry the widow and would bring forth children to the brother's name. Again, that was the leveret custom, leveret marriage. What's so interesting to me, that's what we're seeing really taking place in chapter 3, at least the beginning of all of this. Uh, Naomi is going to instruct Ruth as to what to do. Go down to the threshing floor. Wait until they have eaten. Wait until it's night. Wash yourself, anoint yourself, put on your best garment. And then go down and present yourself at the feet of Boaz. But here's the point. Boaz, Boaz was a kinsman, as we've read, of the family of Elimelech. We're going to find out, though, he's not the nearest kin. He wants to redeem Ruth, but he has to make sure that the nearest kin doesn't want to. But here's what we're looking at right here. Naomi's advice to Ruth and Boaz's response, that's what you'll find in chapter 3. But here's what I've pondered throughout this last week. How is it that situations like this, marriages like this, can be stronger can be longer lasting than marriages that are entered in our society. We scap, uh, scoff at the idea of a man marrying his brother's widow simply to prolong the name. We marry, we say, based upon a lot of different things, usually for looks, instead of based upon the principles of truth. And how is it that their marriages were so strong? Their marriages were so lasting. The principle involved here is love, biblical love. A true understanding, a right concept of what biblical love is all about. Biblical love is selfless. It's not selfish. And we live today in such a shallow society. We confuse love with lust. Thus, we are such a selfish people. We are willing and ready to dissolve marriage for any reason or for no reason at all. And so look at this last point here. Biblical love is more about our relationship to God than it is about our relationship to one another. Did you hear that? Biblical love, I'm talking about within marriage, it's more about our relationship to to God than it is about our relationship to one another. Here's what I mean. The point being, you are only as committed to your husband, wife, as you are to your God. Do we realize that? We talk about strengthening our marriages. The way that we do that is by loving God more deeply, strengthening our relationship with Him. Joseph did not refrain from adultery with Potiphar's wife because he was married. That wasn't the reason. He says, I can't do this because I'm a married man. I love my wife too much. Now, if he were married, that would have been part of his reasoning based upon his character. But what kept Joseph pure was he said, how can I do this great evil and sin against my God? You see, when we have that foundation, and we love God that immensely, then again we listen to Him as He teaches us to love our husbands, to love our wives. Yes, Ruth distinguished herself, loyalty, labor, love. Last of all, legacy. Legacy is something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. Now, Naomi's legacy. Scott read it for us a moment ago. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. You know what's so interesting about this? When you read about Obed, his name means worshiper or one who worships. But you can also read concerning Obed in the genealogy of our blessed Lord. Matthew 1 and verse 5, Luke 3 and verse 32. And lastly, think about this. When you think about Ruth, when you think about what transpired in that great book, it went from trial 
to tragedy to triumph. And what I mean by that, from trial because they were escaping famine to tragedy. They went from famine to death. But as they went from famine to death, from trial to tragedy, it ended up in triumph. As we note also from bitterness to blessing. In the first chapter, Naomi says, Do not call me Naomi, meaning pleasantness. Call me Mara, meaning bitter. But she moves through this book from bitterness to blessings. A wonderful legacy from learning to cope to living with hope. That's what she does. In the first chapter, notice this. In chapter 1, look what she says at the end of verse 13. Chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. That's how she felt. The hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Look at verse 20 in chapter 1. But she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. But notice this now in chapter 2. Look at verse 20. Because in chapter 1, she's learning to cope. In chapter 2, she's beginning to live in hope. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. There are many times in life, circumstances seem to make us bitter if we're not careful. We need to learn, yes, to cope. And we cope by learning to live in hope. The child of God has so much to live for, so much to hope concerning. Last but not least, look at this quote. I do not know what the future holds, but I know who holds it. The book of Ruth is all about future. We see Naomi in a present situation, and she is consumed with that present agony, her present situation, circumstance. But God has a future for her. One last verse I'd like for us to read together. Turn with me to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29. And I think you'll find that in verse 11, how fitting this is, not only for what Jeremiah is dealing with, with his own people going into captivity, God telling them they'll go into captivity, but they will come out as a remnant. But notice these words as it relates to so many situations in the Bible. Specifically tonight as it relates to the book of Ruth. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. God says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God says, I want you to understand, I know the thoughts that I have for you. I know the plans. We may not, but they're thoughts of peace, not for evil, to give you a future, to give you a hope. That's exactly what Naomi finds in the book of Ruth. Now tonight, what about ourselves? We went to the book of Ruth really trying to see what she can teach us about life, how to live a better life. But as we look at her loyalty and her labor and her love and her legacy, what about us? What about our loyalty? Are we faithful to the Lord at this very moment? What about our labor? Are we fervent? Are we faithful? Are we steadfast, always abounding in the work of the Lord? What about our love? Do we love Him more fervently now than we ever have? Has our love grown? Has our love matured? If so, what a legacy we can have in this life. What a legacy we can leave for others. Nehemiah says, remember me, O oh my God, for good. Nehemiah 13 and verse 21. Let's also live with that concept in mind. Remember me, O oh my God, for good. Tonight, 
if there's anything in your life that is amiss, if there's anything as God looked at your life, he would not be able to find the good, but the sin that now separates you from him. Will we change those things? Will we be wise enough to use the time before us to repent of our sins, to confess that sin, to be restored to our first love? If you have a need spiritually tonight, won't you come right now while together we stand and as we sing?